Now, what is the uh, explanation of this of this difference between conscious processing and unconscious processing? According to Dehane et al., the answer is the global workspace theory. Dehane calls it the global neuronal workspace theory. I'm just going to shorten that to global workspace theory, which was originally developed by Bernard Bars, but Dehane has really advanced the theory uh, quite considerably in terms of looking at the brain mechanisms and looking at how the processes uh, function. So according to the global workspace theory, what is going on when you're conscious is an integration of information that is broadcast to the rest of the system. So information that's in the global workspace is conscious and everything that's not in the global workspace is not conscious. Uh, the global workspace concept is a, is a computer architecture term and the idea is of a, of a workspace is, is to integrate information from different processing modules. So uh, Dehane has, has taken that, that architecture and said, look, this is what is going on with consciousness. We've got all of these different modules that are processing information unconsciously and you can see the different arrows coming into the workspace, you know, your long-term memory, your evaluative systems, your attentional systems, your perceptual systems, all of those different systems are processing information in this non-conscious, routine sort of way. And what happens is that they compete for access into the global workspace. And you need the global workspace to broadcast the information to the motor systems and to the other systems in order to coordinate your action. Uh, so this is how they talk about it on, on page 78. Um, and this is the left side under conscious access as an accumulation of evidence leading to an all or none ignition, okay? Um, and this is that first paragraph, the very end, the last sentence. Accumulation of evidence has been demonstrated with non-conscious stimuli, but only conscious stimuli cross the threshold beyond which an overt strategy can be flexibly de deployed. So we've got all these things going on non-consciously. We've got lots of evidence that things are going on non-consciously. But only when you cross this threshold into consciousness do you have the ability to flexibly deploy that information. You can do different things with it through the fact of integration. And then on 79, um, uh, the, the very initial segment on conscious processing as global information sharing, this is where uh, Dehane and company are really laying out what they're claiming about the theory. So this is, this is kind of their, their proposal. Global neuronal workspace theory proposes that conscious access stems from a cognitive architecture with an evolved function the flexible sharing of information throughout the cortex. So that's what consciousness is doing. You get access to the workspace in order to share information flexibly throughout the cortex, all around the brain. The information goes from, uh, from the workspace to everything else. While non-conscious stimuli are processed in parallel by special cortical processors, conscious perception would be needed in order to flexibly root a selected stimulus through a series of non-routine information processing stages. So if you need to try to um, do something that's not routine, some novel task, you need to integrate information to keep yourself on task, you need to have conscious processing to do that. Um, the task is actually done by the, by the unconscious modules, but what the global workspace does, what consciousness does, is integrate what's going on in the different places to help keep you on task so that you can organize that information in a flexible sort of way. So this is the claim of the global workspace theory and as a, a neuroscience theory, it's wonderful in accommodating the data about the differences between the kinds of information that's processed consciously and the kinds of information that's processed unconsciously. But what it fails to do, the objection to the theory, is that it doesn't explain why this information is conscious. 
It doesn't say why there is something that it's like to be processing information in this global ignition sort of way. So it does a good job as a neuroscience theory, but it's still not solving the philosophical question of the hard problem. So that's one of the worries about the global workspace theory. And you can also think as a sort of exercise for yourself how the global workspace theory does in answering the objections that Dennett raised against Cartesian materialism. So remember what those two objections are, that there are parallel serial processes, and so there's no place where it all comes together in consciousness, no place and time where it comes together in consciousness. So think about whether global workspace theory has an answer to that. Uh, and the homunculus objection that um, if there's a theater, then there has to be an audience and that creates an infinite regress. Is there a way in which the global workspace theory gets around that objection? So think about how global workspace theory would respond to those objections in addition to the hard problem objection uh, that, um, that that was raised. So every theory that we're talking about has its advantages and has its disadvantages. So as we're continuing through, be thinking about, you know, what you think is the, the best advantages and the least worst um, disadvantages. Uh, and those are uh, reasons to choose one theory over another theory. And those will be the arguments that you uh, use to say why you choose one or another theory. The final consideration uh, that we have is the information integration theory. Dehane et al. consider this theory in uh, relation to their claim about the integration of information in the global workspace. And what they say is that um, information integration is an interesting theory, that it accommodates the data um, and, uh, and, and is useful in quantifying information integration. So just to uh, review what information integration theory claims, they claim that information is critical in consciousness. Uh, and what information is, they use a technical engineering description, definition of information as the reduction of uncertainty. That when a state moves from possible states to a single state, there's a reduction of, inf of, of uncertainty and that generates information. So a light switch can be either on or off. Those are two possible states that it can be. When it uncertainty is reduced to just being on uh, or off, then one bit of information is conveyed by that state. With a brain, 100 billion neurons interacting with one another, there are all kinds of states. The complexity of the brain is vast. And so when you're in one particular state, as opposed to the multiple uh, thousands, millions of other possible states, then that um, has a, a great deal, that carries a great deal of information. And so, um, so what uh, the information integration theory says is when there's a high degree of information, then there's a high degree of consciousness in relation to integration. So the other component is integration when those contents appear unified. So not only having a high degree of information, but integration of those uh, bits of information that they uh, appear unified together in a particular state. Um, so right now, your particular state that you're in carries a high degree of information. It's very specific about what you're thinking, what you're seeing, uh, how you're feeling, what past experiences are being activated by the, the um, uh, experience that you're having right now, um, and that's all integrated in a unified uh, state. Uh, so according to information integration theory, um, this information integration just is consciousness. That when you've got information that's integrated, it's consciousness. And what um, Dehane wants to say is, is that that's a good um, indicator of, of level of consciousness, that the data that information integration produces, they've got models of how much information is produced and how integrated it is, and they can make uh, uh, claims about distinctions between, for example, sleep and wakefulness, between anesthesia and coma. They can articulate different levels of consciousness based on 
how the brain is integrating uh, its, its informational relations. Um, so all of that is, is interesting and useful neuroscience, to Hain et al. say, but that doesn't tell us what consciousness is because it doesn't distinguish between what's conscious and what's not conscious. So remember that for the global workspace theory, you have to get to a certain threshold. You have to cross the threshold of integration to be in the specific architecture of the global workspace. That's what information is conscious. Everything outside that, you know, might be information, it might be integrated in its little module, but unless you're in the workspace, you're not conscious. And so, uh, according to global workspace theory, information integration is doing some nice work, but it's not sufficient for a theory of consciousness. Um, and in particular, the objection here is panpsychism, the idea that a, a light switch is a little bit conscious is implausible and what we need is a theory that it distinguishes between conscious integration and non-conscious integration and uh, the global workspace theory does that work according to Dehane and company. So keep thinking about the unconscious, the distinction between unconscious processing and conscious processing. You know, is it this sort of panpsychist degree of, of processing that, um, you know, that, that my subsystems are a little bit conscious, but me as a whole system is a lot conscious. This light bulb is a little bit conscious. I'm more conscious. The, the laptop is somewhere in between our consciousness in terms of its integration of information. Does that seem plausible to you? Or are you more interested in something like the global workspace theory that articulates, uh, you know, these things are non-conscious, this is conscious, this is the function of consciousness. Um, you know, what kind of theory is making the most sense to you? Um, and, and explore that from your own experience. Do you have a clear sense of what counts as consciousness and what counts as not conscious? Uh, does it make sense to you that the function of consciousness would be this kind of global integration uh, sort, of, sort of operation? And also be paying attention, and this is a weird kind of thing, pay attention to your unconscious. Um, you know, you can't really pay attention to it because if you pay attention to it then it becomes conscious but you know as you're going through your day you know stop yourself and think back to the last five minutes ten minutes um, and think back on the sorts of things uh, that were going on and and what what was conscious of that of that last five ten minutes and what was not conscious of that ten, five ten minutes um, you know what are your experiences as your uh, playing an instrument, doing sports, washing the dishes, going to the grocery store, sitting in class. What part of that is conscious and what part of that is unconscious to try to articulate what the distinction is between conscious experiences and unconscious experiences, if there is one, um, you know, or if it's an illusion, if there really is just sensation, attention, and memory, and reporting, um, you know, think about these different, uh, these different you know, ways of thinking about consciousness and what makes the most sense to you in terms of a theory of what it's like to be you.